think we're just about ready to get started here. Hello and welcome, everyone. Um, should have a bunch of people online, should be able to hear me now. So welcome, everyone. I see we have a <coughs> large and diverse group of people again, which is always awesome to see that in uh, our Stata.net events, or in this particular case, State of AI, where we look at what's going on in the world of artificial intelligence. Got a ton of stuff to talk about today. Um, before we get into that, uh, let me switch to my slide deck here and let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Marcus Egger. I'm the president and chief software architect uh, of an organization known as the Code Group, which uh, has been around for 30 years. I'm proud of that. Uh, we had a big celebration last December about that. Been a wild ride and it's never been more fun than it is today with all the AI stuff we got going on. So I'm the guy who started all this. Um, I do spend a lot of time presenting, writing, uh, but probably like most of you guys, I spend most of my time writing production code, working on production applications, managing production projects, and so on. So that's uh, who I am. Um, who is the code organization? Uh, the code organization, the code group, is a conglomerate of several different organizations or subdivisions, I should say. Our main business is consulting, custom app dev. Uh, we also have a sizable staffing operation that's a little bit different from other staffing companies, providing uh, skilled labor, career development, and so on. But you may know us best from uh, Kind of a little bit of a side business of ours, which is Code Magazine or Code Training, which are the most publicly visible things we're doing. So I'm involved in all of that. Um, there's a few marketing slides in here. By the way, you're going to get all these slides after the event. We're going to send up out a follow-up email with download links for all that. So a lot of these slides that are in here, I'm not going to spend that much time on, uh, especially the marketing ones, but you can get some more information. The short version is Code is your one-stop shop for all things related to building software, whether that is training, mentoring, all the way up to actually implementing it. Uh, and of course, a lot of what we're doing these days revolves around AI. It's the big thing. It's uh, what we spend a lot of research time on and all that. So it takes a lot of my time, especially. Uh, but it's only one of many things we're doing. We're doing anything from cloud development, database development, app development, mobile, web, desktop, uh, uh, services, um, all kinds of things, but but AI certainly is a big part of it. And, and by the way, if you are sitting in this presentation today and uh, you are maybe a developer and you're wondering, you know, gee, this is a lot of cool stuff. How how can I tell my, my managers about this? How can my board of directors know about this? That sort of stuff. We do offer an executive briefing that we do to people, either in person or online. And there's a small and a large version of this. The large version includes a pilot project, but the small version is completely free, so I'm not selling you anything here. Uh, it's just something you can uh, have us come out and do if you're interested in that and, and want more information about how a lot of this stuff applies to your specific situation. Okay, like I said, we have a staffing organization, which is of interest for you, both potentially both as uh, somebody who needs people, or it might be interesting to you in case you are uh, trying to develop your own career. Uh, so check that out. Uh, that's about all I want to say about that. Again, you have the slides after the presentation with all those links in them. Um, also, if you're not a Code Magazine subscriber yet, uh, Code Magazine is a publication that comes out in print as well as digital. And if you don't already have a subscription, we're, uh, this is an offer for you and your friends uh, to get a free subscription, no strings attached. Um, and that is that. I do have a favor to ask uh, for all of you in this presentation. Um, you could do us a huge favor by filling out a survey after this so we know how we are doing, but also we know what kind of topics you want us to cover in the future in these free events. So again, not selling you anything, but you could really help me out personally if, if you went and you took this survey by the end of the week. Uh, if you take it by the end of the week, uh, we, we actually raffle off a gift certificate. If you take it later, it still counts. So helps us to shape these events for the future and figure out what topics you would like to see. All right, so that's it for the housekeeping. Um, uh, what's on the agenda for today? Uh, this is the state of AI version of the stata.net presentations we do. So we want to talk about AI. Uh, it's 
also part of our stato.net series. What that means is I'm assuming you are somewhat technical, possibly a developer. So that's the approach from uh, the angle from which we are this approaching. And my goal is to look at AI and show what's possible today. We have all this AI hype. A lot of people have questions around, well, what does that mean exactly? How can I build it into my own apps? How can I use AI that's out there in a productive way? So that's what this is all about. You're going to look at current AI capabilities. You're going to look a lot at OpenAI and Azure OpenAI and what Microsoft is doing. Uh, but we're also going to talk a little bit about other alternatives. Uh, OpenAI is what everybody is talking about. And they certainly have excellent offers. Um, but there's many others out there in the industry that also op uh, offer up uh, really, really good. And I guess I should figure out a way to disable my WhatsApp here. Uh, also able to figure out really, really good models. And a lot of what I'm telling you here today is interchangeably usable uh, with other models. And I'll point that out to you. Now, I can't possibly talk about all of them at once. So I'm kind of using OpenAI as a placeholder for all of them because if I pick one, I might as well pick the, the big player. Uh, but then again, this is not just specific to OpenAI, and I'll point that out as well. We have the new Copilot paradigm. Uh, the Copilot paradigm is something that's driven by Microsoft. So Microsoft's building this Copilot concept into all their applications now. Uh, and it's something that Microsoft's doing and something that we as developers should also be doing. So we'll talk about that whole paradigm and we'll take a look at what it's doing in Office uh, and the Microsoft world, but then we'll also talk about how to build it into our own applications. Now I have some slides at the beginning of this. I uh, saw on the list of attendees, there's a lot of new people that came that are coming to our first event. So we need to make sure that we kind of get on, on the same page. Uh, if you've already seen me do those slides, Bear with me, that's only a, sh a short part of the intro, but that's the starting point of it. And then I just want to show you guys a whole bunch of stuff we're doing in the real world. Uh, I want to show you real world examples of how we built this into apps because I think that gives you the best overview of what's going on. And in a lot of ways, I think that's what Code Group, my organization, is all about. We, we don't claim to know it all, but we do occupy an interesting place in the industry because with our involvement in community, with our publishing a magazine, with us being involved in uh, organizing events of all sizes, online, in-person, conferences, user groups, all that. With our consulting business, we sit kind of in the middle of all these different ideas that are flowing around and information about projects people are doing. And so we are kind of a consolidator of that information and, and I want to pass this on to you in this presentation here today kind of from a consolidated view of the real world to you type of thing. Uh, so that's going to be a big part of this presentation. Uh, and it's kind of interesting. I looked at when we did the last overview of AI as part of our Stata.net series. And it was in January of 2023, so more than a year ago. And boy, was it a different world a year ago. Uh, a year ago, ChatGPT had just come out. People started hearing about ChatGPT a little bit. Uh, or, or you know, maybe had heard about it a month earlier, something like that. But it certainly was at the very, very beginning of that becoming mainstream. Microsoft hadn't talked about Copilot yet, anything like that. It seems almost inconceivable at this point that only a little over a year ago we lived in a world where none of this stuff existed yet. So, um, uh, ha not having looked at a lot of that, there's certainly a lot of new stuff we're doing in this presentation here today. And some of the things I'm going to show you today are going to be the first time we've ever shown any of that to the public. So I'm a little excited about that as well. So, so it'll be fun. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I only have a handful of people here in the room live. Uh, if you are an on, in the online audience and you have any questions, I have uh, Tim uh, monitor the chat. And if there's any questions that he can't answer or none of my people can answer in the chat, then he will just pass those on to me and I will try to answer them as part of the presentation. It's all live. Um, and if uh, a question is too long, we'll just address it at the end and I'm going to stay around until every question is answered. All right, so let's go into 
AI and that let's take a look at an overview of AI and and just real briefly what are we even talking about here right like what is artificial intelligence and machine learning because this has been a a term that's been around for quite some time I think it's in the 50s was the first time the term artificial intelligence was used but of course at the time we were talking about a completely different thing from what we're talking about today and in fact when we talk about the actual technical capabilities that we have uh, there's also a bit of a difference between that and what some people uh, worry about or imagine or, or envision what AI is like. A lot of people envision AI like a persona. Uh, you know, we like to give them names like Siri. Uh, but that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, a machine being able to perform tasks that appear intelligent. But spoiler alert right here, they're not really intelligent. What we are talking about is very, very large scale math, statistical math, pattern matching, that type of stuff. And it's really just a piece of code that runs that produces some useful output. Right? So it's not like this thing is living there and, and are we killing it if we turn it off? Or It's just like a function that returns an interesting result. It's just a super fancy function in that sense. Now, what made AI so big in the last year, uh, what started in, uh, I would argue, 2023, late 22, but really it started in 2023, is that AI has gotten to a point where it truly appears intelligent. It, it's fakery, if you want to think of it like that, but it's gotten to a point where it truly appears intelligent. So that's what happened last year. And I would say in 2024, we are now picking up these bits and pieces we had that, that enabled us to build that. And, and from a developer's point of view, you know, we're not usually creating our own AI. We're just picking something that's already there and then we're building on top of that, standing on the shoulder of giants type of scenario. Uh, but 2024 to me is the year where the implementation of that happens. We now have a lot of the capabilities. All of that is moving very fast. And now the, the bulk of business application developers is now getting ready to deploy that. So it's gone from AI is the thing that's not quite there yet, that's always a little bit science fiction to, wow, we can actually do it now. And, and it's not five years away, but it happened last year. And so that's, uh, I think, the big, the big news about AI and why everybody is talking about it. Um, now, we can now slice and dice this any number of ways. We can now argue about what it even means to be intelligent. Uh, uh, we could argue about what it means to be superhumanly intelligent. And the reality is, it's, it's much a matter of definition, right? Is the ability to play chess or Go, Go is a particular good example, the board game Go uh, is a very complex board game beyond of, uh, the complexity of chess. And not too long ago, it was considered impossible that a computer would uh, beat a human uh, in playing Go because we thought you had to be cunning, you had to be deceptive, you had to have all these capabilities that humans have. And it turned out it didn't take any of that. It didn't take true intelligence. It just took a very large and sophisticated machine learning model. And this now happened several years ago that the computers became superhumanly good at playing Go and chess. And now actually it's, uh, it's the noteworthy thing when a human does beat the machine. It happens very, very rarely at this point. But there was an incident a few years ago, two years ago, I think, where uh, the number one ranked Go player in the world actually beat uh, a computer in playing Go and, and that became the noteworthy thing and it's not happening very often. So in a way we've had this level of intelligence, but again, it's, it's fakery in that sense. It's not true intelligence. It doesn't mimic the human neocortex or, or, or even the larger brain, even though I question the usefulness of that uh, outside of academia. Uh, but it just turned out it takes takes very advanced pattern matching to do a lot of these things. And so here are some examples of things we can do. Uh, you know, for us business application developers, predicting things like market developments, uh, demand and supply, uh, doing things like machine translations, reviewing documents, finding patterns in data. Uh, all of that is the computer being intelligent and whether that is true intelligence or not probably doesn't really matter so much as long as the computer can perform a very interesting task for us. Um, and this is just a slightly different way of looking at this. Um, 
you know, what does it mean to be superhumanly intelligent? Does it mean you're faster, you, you can consider more factors, make fewer errors, and so on and so on. And the reality is the computer has been there for a long time, and this latest wave just uh, steps that up a little bit. Uh, and then people go and say, well, is this dangerous, right? If you are a software developer who, who argues we should be using more AI, you may often encounter this resistance you know, where people say, oh, no, this is dangerous. We don't want to do that. What if it gets out of hand? People will worry about the singularity, which is the point in time that AI gets smarter than humans. And, and then I always say, well, what does that mean? Does it mean smarter than the average human? Does it mean smarter than the smartest human? Does it mean smarter than all the human knowledge combined? I mean, we have people that are smarter than the average human by definition of the term average. Um, that doesn't mean that they immediately take over the world and become, you know, runaway intelligent and just their intelligence explodes. It just means they're a little smarter than average and life goes on. And uh, I often wonder why people think runaway intelligence in computers is the most likely scenario because learning takes a long time and so on. Uh, but be that as it may be, it's probably fine that we have people worrying about it. I think that's a very good thing. Uh, but I think we have enough people worrying about it. And for us as the everyday developer, the important thing to understand is that the AI we are building today is not that. It's not generally intelligent. It's not going to learn more and more and just become this runaway thing we can't control. That's not the technology we have. And it's not a better version of the technology we have today. It would take a completely different approach to to AI to get into that. So if somebody worries about that, you know, tell them, tell them about all that stuff. And that's, that's what we're going to worry about for, for this talk. Now, one of the things that is uh, an actual worry is that it has an impact on the economy. I have a slide about that here. Uh, that, I think, is the more realistic worry with today's stuff. And this has been the worry with everything that happens uh in technological advances i mean certainly the industrial revolution had a big impact on the economy and the society and a lot of people lost their jobs uh, there was a lot of criticism about it but at the end of the day i would say we're all better off uh, for for the outcome of the industrial revolution and i think that's going to happen here as well um, there's some estimates that by 2040 2050 about half the jobs that uh, we are currently doing can be replaced by AI. Sounds pretty scary. Whether that's actually true or not, very, very hard to say. What we observe in the AI that we uh, deploy today is actually almost more of an opposite effect. Uh, so a typical example of some of the things we are doing in my own organization would be that we are using AI to generate art because we are a magazine publisher and we do other things that we need designers and art for. And in the past, it's been uh, often prohibitively expensive to deploy designers and art at the scale that I would really like to deploy. So, uh, you know, if we publish a magazine article and it's on the website, I would love there to be some graphic with every article, but we have tens of thousands of articles. Uh, it's cost prohibitive to spend two, three, four thousand dollars on every article to have custom uh, art generated. So we didn't do that in the past, but we can now do it with AI, and I'll show you some of that. And now people say, oh, but you're taking away the job of the designer. Well, as it turns out, today we are probably generating a thousand times more art than we did a year ago, or maybe more than that. Um, and the vast majority of that gets generated by AI. But A, I need a person to supervise that AI and pick the things that the AI does. And secondly, uh, you know, a percent or two or three of all the art we need still needs to be humanly designed. And as it turned out, turns out that two, three percent that we do manually is still more than we did before. So uh, we actually employ more designers today than we did a year or two ago. And that's the kind of pattern that we see with a lot of stuff going on. And then people say, well, but then what's the benefit? Now you're spending more money than before. That's true. But I'm also several orders of magnitude more productive so it's well worth doing that so so that's kind of the pattern that we see today so i've kind of gone backwards a little bit uh, in my worry about that impact because so far it just hasn't really uh, turned out like that so i've been mostly a, a, a beneficial thing overall i also want to mention this real brief here ai and robotics uh, people often think 
uh, robots are part of this or a machine that actually does stuff right in the real world so any kind of robot type of scenario the reality is we are much much further behind in robotics than we are in ai so that might be the next interesting wave in some years to come but uh, you know as a simple example it would be relatively easy uh, to create an ai that can design the interior of a home it would be exponentially harder to create a robot that can then actually do that and be a carpenter or, or a tile layer or anything like that. Uh, so, so that's interesting, right? Also interesting in what the impact will be on uh, the society and the economical impacts on that. So there's something to think about. Um, now, how are you going to be really good in AI, right? What's the, what's the way to win the AI game? How, how do you become a big player in it? And there's several important factors for AI to be successful. Uh, the big reason AI has become so successful over the last few years and why we're even here to talk about this today is A, the availability of data and B, the availability of compute power. And the cloud has a lot to do with this. So the enormous amounts of data we can now process and also generate in various ways and access relatively easily is a huge factor and then the simple matter that we have just enormous amounts of processing power available uh, on the cloud and with modern hardware and all kinds of things that have come together those are on a technological level the two main factors that have uh, kicked off this latest wave of ai because training ais which is what you do. You don't program an AI in that sense, but you train an AI by allowing it to look at a lot of data and finding patterns into fitting uh, statistics to those patterns in the data. That's what it's all about. So those are two super important points, and that's pretty much globally available right now. But then on top of that, you need a culture of funding and, and entrepreneurship and uh, people that are willing to fund high-risk projects because that's what we're talking about right now. You then need the data scientists and the programmers and all those people that can actually do that. And finally, you need the political support for all of that. And there's really two main en environments in the world that are really good at this right now, and that's the US and China uh, that have all these factors going for itself. Now, personally, uh, I'm originally from Europe. Uh, that's an environment where I'm a lot more worried about uh, all this stuff because Europe's not very well positioned in any of these and so we'll see how all of that works out uh, but that kind of gives you a little bit of guideline as to you know where am i how do i fit into this uh, if you are trying to figure that out for yourself now a lot of this is also to do with the low level players now when you build ai you don't build the fundamentals yourself typically unless you're a really large player in this um, but you're using what other people create. So in that sense, it becomes more, well, what's even available to me? Am I in an area where some of these things are, are legally not allowed and stuff like that, right? So those are some things to think about. If you're interested in some more reading about this, here are some books that I find uh, very, very interesting for all this stuff. Uh, the first one is AI Superpowers. Reads like a novel. Uh, very, very, it's a page turner, I would say. And it talks about how both uh, the US and China are positioned in this race for AI supremacy. Now, it's uh, a few years old now, so in that sense, it's outdated. But a lot of the, the fundamentals, the cultural aspects and so on are still there. So it's an easy to read book. Uh, I recommend that to you. Superintelligence uh, by Nick Bostrom is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. It's not easy to read and it worries about a lot of the aspects of AI. But Still very interesting, just, uh, just a much longer, much harder read, I would argue. Um, then one that's kind of really interesting is AI 2041 uh, by the same author that wrote AI Superpowers. And this is a book that's very interesting. It has 10 different chapters, 10 different scenarios that it talks about. And each of those chapters talks about, first it has a story, it's a, a science fiction story that defines what could happen with AI in the future, like self-driving cars and there's a story around that. And, and, and it's just a science fiction short story at that point. And then the second part of the chapter is, okay, what tech do we need to build to make that happen? And, and then it gets very technical. And, and so very fascinating read. So uh, definitely something I recommend to anyone. 
And then finally, really, really interesting is A Thousand Brains from Jeff Hawkins, who is also the founder of Palm Computing, who turns out to be a neuroscientist who just kind of went through the computing stages and entrepreneurship in software and hardware uh, when neuroscience wasn't far enough along yet. And then he sold Palm and then eventually went back into researching the brain. And he is also into AI. And so it's a neuroscience book for non-neuroscientists like us. Surprisingly easy to read and it's very thought provoking and explains a lot about how how we think thought works and how that relates to AI and what AI can and can't do. So pretty interesting. Uh, you know, three of these four books are super easy to read and super intelligent, a little harder, but still uh, a recommendation. So um, this is kind of the catch up of where we're at on a theoretic level. So now let's talk a little bit more about AI and machine learning in practice today. What are our capabilities today? Uh, we do what's generally called narrow learning. In other words, we have a specific scenario that we want to train an AI for, like driving a car, like predicting uh, product demand over the holidays, like uh, telling you what movie you might want to watch next. Or, and this is where it's gotten really interesting over, over the recent months and years, teaching a computer to talk, like ChatGPT, appearing human in a conversation, and also the ability to generate art uh, and deal with the spoken word and, and just perception things like that. And there's different levels of learning, deep and shallow. There's the enormously large AIs that we can just use, uh, that use deep learning models and, and very large neural nets and interesting techniques. And then there's the more shallow learning and, and much smaller models that we can train ourselves. And we'll see all of that here in some of the samples that I'll be bringing up. What's important to understand is we have no real general artificial intelligence. In other words, we're not replicating the brain and have a thing that just can think. And then we say, well, now you want, I want you to learn all about the stock market or I want you to learn all about manufacturing or database design or anything. It, you know, it, we're not talking about intelligence at that level. We're just talking about a specifically well-defined purpose, what we call narrow learning. Now, narrow learning can still be very generally useful. So having something like a chat GPT and the features that emerge out of that is generally useful. It's just not an AI that will sit there and, and one day learn completely new things uh, like becoming a math and statistics wizard or something like that. Okay. Uh, so what we can do with a lot of that stuff today is, is mind-bogglingly useful and very applicable in economic and, and truly productive ways today. Okay, I talked about that. Uh, so one way of using AI is through the Microsoft offerings. If you're in this talk, uh, which you know still has the stata.net label on it, which probably means you're coming from some sort of Microsoft background and, and are looking at the development world from, from that viewpoint, even though you're probably now doing many other things. Uh, the Microsoft offerings are very interesting. They're also very interesting because Microsoft is rapidly becoming the dominant player in this industry in terms of providing these services, not necessarily making them, but providing the services and the infrastructure to run it on. And uh, so if you are an existing Microsoft customer, the Azure Cognitive Services group of things that Microsoft offers is super interesting. And there's all kinds of different things. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly here. Uh, but there's things related to speech. There's things related to language. You can do computer vision, image analysis, face recognition. Uh, you can do translations. You can do uh, transcriptions of spoken word. You can do speaker recognition. Uh, all kinds of stuff that's super, super helpful. Decision making, uh, sentiment analysis, like you know, people are posting comments about my product. Are they happy or not? That type of stuff. Uh, so Microsoft has had a lot of that. And uh, a lot of that is developed by Microsoft. But then more recently, they've also struck up a partnership with OpenAI. And OpenAI is an organization uh, that we have to talk about here. But the long story short is Microsoft has a partnership with OpenAI and therefore is reselling all the OpenAI services through their Azure Cloud offerings, which makes a lot of sense for a number of reasons. First of all, Microsoft has all the infrastructure to run this AI on and it takes massive amounts of infrastructure to do this. 
Uh, secondly, Microsoft has reach into the entire world, has data centers around the entire world, which means Microsoft can play well uh, with regulations and other things that need to be taken care of or geographic load balancing, that type of stuff. So if you are listen to, listening to this presentation from Germany, let's say, and you think, well, gee, I'd like to use this, but in Germany there's the rule I can take customer data out of Germany. Well, Microsoft got you covered because they have a data center or, or regions in Germany for this specific purpose, and the OpenAI services are offered through that. Also, Microsoft has the ability to pair these services with some of their other offerings. So if you want to combine an, an OpenAI model, an OpenAI AI, uh, with, say, your SQL Server data that you already have in Azure, then Microsoft's a really good uh, player in that because they have the ability to combine all of this. But uh, um, at the same time, OpenAI is its own independent organization. So let's talk about who they are because they are the big elephant in the room. They are what started this craze lately. That's why, uh, that's why it's uh, your aunt that knows about AI, right? Other players are still very important. We as developers know about them. But the public at large knows about AI mainly because of open AI. So who are they? They're, they started as a nonprofit organization in San Francisco in 2015, uh, started by, I think, a dozen or so original founders. And uh, the goal was to create general, generally intelligent AI, right? Artificial general intelligence that essentially just becomes a human brain on a, on a chip sort of thing. That was the goal. Now, the way they define that is not quite the same way that academia would, but they define it more as, you know, it doesn't have to be truly intelligent as long as it's as useful as that. Uh, so they're not doing true general intelligence at this point, nothing that's uh, sentient or has consciousness or anything like that. But that was the goal they set out to do, right? And so that was a nonprofit organization. And then later they started uh, OpenAI Limited Partnership, which is the for-profit arm of OpenAI. And I still have some odd mechanism of capping the profit and, and all that. Uh, but it's a for-profit organization. And when we talk about OpenAI today, that's who we are usually talking about. And what's interesting is that Microsoft made a huge investment into OpenAI, and Microsoft now, in fact, owns 49% of OpenAI, the limited partnership, not the nonprofit. And then we don't exactly know what the other ownership percentages are like, but as far as we know, 2% uh, belong to the original nonprofit, so that gives the nonprofit plus Microsoft full control, and the rest apparently is uh, split up between the original uh, founders of this. What's also very interesting to understand is that all of the OpenAI infrastructure, all their servers, everything they need, runs on Microsoft hardware. So OpenAI doesn't run on Amazon's cloud or anything like that, but OpenAI runs on Azure infrastructure worldwide. And in fact, the biggest part of the Microsoft investment is infrastructure investment. So you may hear horror stories like people out there may say, oh yeah, OpenAI is burning through so much money, they're gonna go bankrupt any day now. Well, that's not really true. The, they do burn through a lot of money, but it's more funny money. It's actually Azure cloud resources they consume that Microsoft gives them. So that's what the Microsoft investment is and that's how they burn through money. If they had to pay for all of that for real, it would literally be millions reportedly that they're burning through every day. Okay. So why is OpenAI so important? Well, they did a few really important things in their uh, relatively short corporate history. Uh, in 2020, they announced GPT-3. GPT-3 is what we call a large language model. A large language model is an AI model that is trained with the purpose of understanding language. Uh, so it's meant to talk, it's meant to comprehend, it's meant to respond in a way that fools you into thinking it's human and it can do interesting reasoning and so forth. That is the goal of GPT and the way that is achieved is it's a model that is trained with as much text as possible in all kinds of languages and then that statistically gives it uh, various features. And so for the first time, you know, this was GPT-3, so there was two other versions of this before, 
but they were pretty rough. And GPT-3, for the first time in 2020, showed us that this is a useful approach, that this is actually probably going to work. And, and it was still r relatively rough, but it was for the first time where you're like, yeah, this is kind of amazing, right? And so that was the first foray into that. Uh, then also, uh, another interesting thing happened in 2021, OpenAI released DALI. DALI is an image generator, and this was the first image generator where you could ask an AI to draw you something, like draw me a horse, and it would draw a horse completely from scratch. It would not go and take an image of a horse and modify it. Right? It would just, from scratch, start drawing a horse. And it was a pretty rough horse, right? It was not very good, but it was recognizable as a horse. And that was a, a big step forward. Uh, so that's the first time a lot of us got that maybe this open AI stuff is interesting. But then the really big thing happened just over a year ago in November of 2022. That's when GPT-3.5 was released. So that's an evolution of what was there two years earlier. But GPT-3.5 was an amazing step forward. It was so amazing, in fact, that most of the people very closely involved in that didn't even expect it to be this good. And, and so you could now start talking with GPT-3.5 and it would appear truly intelligent and, and correspond like a human and, and do so in any language. And, and this blew up. More than 5 million users signed up for this on the first day, which makes it the fastest growing product, at least in the West. Uh, there might be some stuff in China that grew faster, but have a lot of people. Um, so, so just an amazing success story there. And this changed everything. Uh, within Microsoft, this changed everything. Microsoft changed course in the middle of their fiscal year, which in my 30 years of partnership with Microsoft, I've never seen them do before. Uh, they changed it where every product within Microsoft basically has to use this stuff in some way to move into this new paradigm, this new world where we, for the first time in, in my career, and, and even if I was 20 years older, it would be the first time in my career, we, we change paradigm in programming from programmers create top to bottom applications where we have a program that has instruction like if, then, and so on. Uh, which we've meant through many iterations and many programming languages and made that better, but it was really the same idea fundamentally. To We are not doing that anymore. We are not telling the computer what to do. We just have a bunch of data and we find patterns in that data and that'll teach the computer what to do and it's not as predetermined what's going to happen, right? So that's what the huge thing was. Now in March of 2023, so just less than a year ago, GPT-4 was released, which was another big step forward. Uh, but with that said, GPT-3.5 is actually so good that we're still using GPT-3.5 more than GPT-4 to this day. Why? GPT-4 is bigger, it is slower, it is more expensive to run, so you use it only when you have to. Okay. We already talked about that. Um, so the key products that OpenAI has at this point uh, are the GPT models. A lot of people know GPT from the chat GPT uh, website, which is a cool little thing, but it's also almost uh, from a developer's point of view, it's like, well, that's more of a demo than anything else. The more interesting stuff is the tech that's behind it and that we can use that. And then there's also image generation models that receive a lot of press. DALI has evolved considerably since then. We'll talk about that. And then there's other stuff too, like they have the whisper models and uh, those do text recognition and so on. And and again, I'm using OpenAI because they're the big player in this and, and they have very interesting and really good stuff. But there's other players as well. So here's a few other things that you may want to consider. Uh, just some recent developments, for instance. Stable Diffusion 3 has been announced. Stable Diffusion is essentially a competitor to DALI. And there's several of those, right? The, there's Midjourney and Leonardo and and all kinds of stuff. And that's a key thing to recognize is we are not just looking at one model. We are not just looking at one organization making models. Uh, this is moving enormously fast. And while I'm picking out one set of models as an example to make this approachable in the time we have, uh, there's tons of other good stuff out there. So Stable Diffusion 3 just announced some stuff that looks like they're now leapfrogging everybody else again in the image generation department and, and especially things that 
uh, AIs used to be bad at like generating text, uh, for instance, was always a, a problem for the image generators. Uh, so if you had, say, a picture of a person wearing a t-shirt that said something on it, it, the text would usually look horrible and now they can, can do that very impressively. Uh, so that's one example of something. Uh, OpenAI uh, has some other stuff in the hopper, in particular the Sora video generation. Uh, that's something I encourage you to check out, where rather than just creating a single image, they can now generate a video, I think, up to a minute in length. Um, so, so that kind of shows where it's going to go with uh, generating moving pictures. So very, very interesting. Another thing that OpenAI does, like I said, is the Whisper models. Whisper allows you to point at a, a source of audio, whether it's a video or just an audio file, uh, could be typically uh, something like a, a recording of a meeting, or it could be the recording of this presentation here. You could run through Whisper and you get a text version of what I said. So that's super interesting. And I actually have an app here that I already have up and running. Uh, this is an app uh, that Philip Bauer, one of the engineers at Code Consulting, wrote. And what this does is it uses the Whisper model in a local application, this is an application built in Fotino. It's a desktop app uh, built in uh, Fotino, which is an open source project uh, library that we are supporting. Uh, and what I can do in here is I can pick media. So I could just pick some kind of MP4, MP3 file, and it would then do a transcript. And in this case, it happens to be a video of some demo I did at some point. And I could now navigate through this and I see uh, the transcript, uh, the transcription of what I actually said. And to make it even cooler, this whole thing is then hooked up to an AI so I can then ask questions about this. So uh, like in this case, I just said, hey, what does this even do? And then it gives me a whole uh, synopsis of what was said in that particular uh, video in this case. So pretty cool. That's all based on the Whisper model and then the AI is based on a GPT model in this case. Although uh, Philip even made it where you can uh, choose to not use OpenAI's models that run in the cloud, but you could actually use a smaller model that you can download to your own machine and then just run this AI that analyzes stuff on your own machine, which is very cool and uh, a lot of interesting scenarios around that. Like you, you face fewer restrictions, it works offline, potentially stuff like that. So cool stuff going on there. Um, and if you're interested in how this works, uh, send me an email or send Philip an email and, and we'll get you more information on that. In general, I think transcription is a super interesting topic. Uh, so we are working a lot in that right now. So the ability, for instance, to be a customer service type organization, say you have a call center and you on the fly transcribe a phone call so an AI can then understand what's going on and maybe e immediately provide information, right? So if somebody calls in and says, my printer isn't working, well, what printer do you have? Well, I have this or that printer. Well, while you're saying that, the AI already comes up with information what might be wrong. That could be really, really cool, right? So, so that's an area that we are very active in and very interested in. So that's a whisper model. Uh, and again, there's even other transcription models out there. Uh, another thing, and this is kind of more of a story as to what not to do, is uh, Gemini. Gemini is the latest uh, marketing label that uh, Google put on a lot of their stuff. Uh, unfortunately, it kind of backfired. It didn't do it very well. It produced uh, questionable results uh, that certainly weren't well balanced. So then Google pulled that again, and I think now they're going to rebrand it. This is uh, grew out of the BART type of AI that Google had, and, and uh, it's a little you know, <laughs> cautionary tale, let's call it. So... Uh, while Google does interesting stuff, technologically speaking, they really haven't been able to push uh, the limits with their AI as much as others have. We'll see how that develops because technologically they have interesting stuff. A whole other set of models uh, are the Llama models that are put out by Facebook. Uh, Llama 2 in particular is the basis for a lot of other things that happen. So pretty darn good technology. Uh, so definitely something worth looking into. And then there is something and, and one of the few things that I'm aware of uh, in the realm of AI that's coming out of Europe, and that is Mistral. Uh, Mistral is language models that are smaller in parameters, smaller in size, more efficient to run, and have gotten quite a bit of attention lately. 
And just two or three days ago, Microsoft announced that they're making a big investment in Mistral. So Microsoft is not just about open AI, it's also about other things. And Mistral is one of the first things that appears to be coming there. And uh, my personal guess is that Microsoft is going to be very happy running any kind of AI on their infrastructure. And we'll probably see more of that in the future. So these are some examples, but there is, is plenty more. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we've talked about here revolves around language models, revolves around this, this GPT capability. Uh, I'm sure that in this, if you're sitting in this talk, you don't need me to tell you a whole lot about chat GPT. I'm sure you've all tried it. Uh, the important part here is to realize the characteristic of GPT or chat GPT, which is it's a text calculator. It's a statistical engine that calculates text. And what we are trying to do as developers is we are trying to coax as much functionality out of this text calculator as possible. And I'll show you some examples. Now, if you understand that that's what it is, that will help you understanding better how a lot of this stuff flows together. Um, so I'm not going to go into chat GPT. I'm sure you can do that on your own. And we already talked about the fact uh, that this has uh, been very fast adopted. So I'm going to leave it at that. What is another important thing to uh, understand about uh, OpenAI's GPT and chat GPT offerings? It's not one thing. Right? There's different models behind that. Uh, OpenAI has quite a few different GPT models. And what you want to know as the developer is that you don't just want to go for the biggest and the best because that's not efficient and you often don't need that. And that is why I say a lot of us use GPT 3.5 because it works perfectly what, for what we're trying to do. Now, if I wanted to create an AI that helps me write a 2000 page novel, I probably use GPT 4 because it's just better at that. But if I'm uh, using this to search my database or, or maybe even send a quote to a customer and I want it to help me with that, then GPT-3.5 is probably sufficient. And it costs money to run this stuff, right? So uh, you want to be careful to use the minimum uh, possible set that gets the job done. And again, it's also a performance thing. GPT-4 is just much lower than, than 3.5. But it is pretty amazing what it can do. So I've already now repeated myself several times in saying it's just a pattern recognizer. It's just a statistical text engine. But the amazing part is that it can do these just amazing thinking processes. Like this is one example here, uh, which is about, uh, you know, we have a room with a box in it and somebody puts a ball into one box and leaves and then somebody moves it. And then the original person comes back, where do they think the ball is? That kind of logic is, uh, for instance, difficult for, for very young children to do because it's not just about where is the ball, but it's like it's a whole level of abstraction higher. It's like how would another person think about this and then put yourself into that person's shoes. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that GPT-4 can totally reason like that. Not within limits, right? If I say the, the box is transparent at some point, it's not going to appear so smart anymore. But still, just the fact that it can do that and that that emerges out of just this uh, simple text statistic mechanism is, is like super interesting, right? And, and helps us do a lot of stuff. Okay. Now, I already mentioned that you don't always have to use the big model stuff, right? So one more thing here about local models. It is absolutely possible to download models um, that run on your local machine or at least on, on some specialized local hardware or servers uh, that get everything done that you may need to do. And uh, Philip Bauer, who also built the transcriber, uh, has done a, a session on this. And actually, the second bullet point here is wrong. But the point is, we have a, a session about how to use local models. It's beyond what I can cover here today. But uh, go online, codemac.com slash code presents. And you can see the free recording of that session if you're interested in that particular thing. And we'll send you a follow-up link. And, and feel free to contact us. Contact me, Philip, uh, Ian, or Tim, any of my guys that will be able to respond a little quicker. But you can also uh, connect with me. And I'm promising I will respond to email as well. Uh, so that's interesting, right? We have a whole bunch of stuff like that that you can follow up with. So now what can this stuff be used for? And what's realistic today? And one of the things that are realistic today is Microsoft Copilot. 
Bikesoft's building this kind of generative AI, as it's called, into just about everything. And it's branded Copilot. And Copilot uh, is a paradigm, not just a marketing term. So just like we had DOS apps, and then we had apps with a graphical user interface in Windows, and the paradigm was GUIs. Now the paradigm is Copilot, which is you have an assistant that is there to help you with your task. It's not autonomous. It doesn't do it for you but it certainly assists you in a big way. And this is going to appear in every Microsoft product going forward. So it's in Office, it's in Windows, it's also in Visual Studio. Uh, so you may be using GitHub Copilot. If you haven't done that yet, it is absolutely mind-bogglingly amazing what you can do with Copilot. Uh, so I don't have time to show this right now. But I've done this in the past. We have some recordings of that, and that's pretty amazing. Um, but then again, Copilot, the GitHub Copilot that helps us developers is a special case. What's more common is the Copilot that runs in Office or in Windows or in Edge. And so there's a few different. You have the Edge browser, you have a Copilot button in here, and you can pop that up and you can ask it questions. What is the weather? like today and then it goes out and it tries to answer the question now this is fundamentally different from what it does uh, because it has additional understanding it knows i'm currently at the code headquarters in houston texas or in spring texas and it tells us what and so on um, so it knows where i am it knows how to look up that information it's not giving me uh, weather information from two years ago because that's when it was trained but it's giving me weather information from today because it looks up that information on the fly. We call this retrieval augmented generation. So we have a language model that can talk, but talking doesn't mean it's right. Uh, talking just means it talks like a human, but it's not necessarily at all factful. So what happens with the Edge Copilot here, it adds that factfulness by looking into the language model and then it says, here's the data, answer that question based on this data. This is uh, known as Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG, and that's what this does. And that's a super important point, and a point that I can't stress enough. There's nothing in large language models like GPT that imply factfulness. It's only talking the talk, but it's up to us developers to make it factful. And this Copilot is one example of how to do that. If you're not using the Edge browser, you can also go to bing.com and you can ask questions here. All right, and it'll basically do the same stuff that it did in the Copilot, and then we can uh, pick that we want to interact with Copilot. And this is available to anyone. Yeah, it's a little slow here because I'm sharing my screen, but you get the idea, right? So we're not going to spend. Pardon? question online it's lagging it's lagging yeah it's at... so i hear it's lagging online a little bit unfortunately there's really nothing i can do about that but anyway uh, worst case it's going to be in the recording right so that's Copilot in edge now these copilots like i said they start showing up everywhere so i'm running windows 11 and Windows 11, my version now has a Copilot built in. I think this, this differs a little bit based on where you are or what win version you run exactly. But this is Copilot built into Windows 11. I can bring it up by clicking the Copilot here in the bottom right corner or by hitting Windows C, and that also brings up Copilot. And again, I can ask it the same question here. And it will give me a similar answer because it's essentially using the same type of technology. Now, a lot of these things right now are just in its infancy. Uh, so this Copilot in Windows has, is, is useful for some things, and that's kind of cool. And now it's actually like giving me a nonsense answer. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, I should have said, what's the weather like here, probably. Um, but this Copilot, I think, is going to increase drastically in usefulness because you can write plugins for this. So if I'm the creator of Adobe Photoshop, I could write an, a Copilot plugin for Photoshop, and I could then say, open up the images in this folder and, and, and 
auto enhance them and save them or, or whatever the creator wants to do right so in short this is going to become uh kind of a replacement for the start menu is how i envision it right where it just can do a ton of different things for us that's another example and one final example i want to show this is copilot in office in general so if i create a word document for instance uh, i now am licensed to use copilot you need the special license for it right it's an uh, not in every office uh, version, but if you have Copilot license, you now have Copilot showing up like this, and, and you could now do something like write me a story about the weather. My mouse just disappeared. Let's do it with touch. And so it now goes out and it uses uh, whatever chat GPT or OpenAI model it deems correct for this. And uh, it's going to take a little bit of time because, you know, it could write a long story. And then here it goes. It starts writing this story for us uh, about something related to the weather. I have no idea what. All right. And this could be lengthy potentially. Uh, and then we could interact with Copilot further and we could say, okay, uh, this is good, but make it funnier, make it shorter, change this paragraph, add something here, pull in some data there and, and use it for that, right? So stuff like that, uh, which is, I find that interesting. I'm, I'm an author who writes articles. I use it for that sometimes. I got to say, though, the most useful thing to me that Copilot does is not so much generating things. It's nice that Copilot can do things like draft an email response for me, but that's mildly useful. What I find that's really useful is whenever Copilot queries something for me. So it's more interesting for me to say, I have this email chain with 50 emails in the thread, summarize it for me and let me know if there's still open tasks that I have to take care of. And then it goes and does it, right? That works today. Uh, or in Teams, if I have a Teams meeting, I can say, summarize the meeting and let me know what to-do items came out of this and who is supposed to do them and, and, and put them in a, in a to-do list. Those types of things work today. Uh, but it is still early days in Office Copilot. Uh, so there's some other features that I would like, uh, such as show me my five most important emails in my entire inbox that I have to take care of. And it can't quite do it at that scale yet. Those kinds of things are coming according to Microsoft. They're just not in there yet. So right now, Copilot uh, in uh, M365 in Office is a little bit on the expensive side. And you can see Microsoft is still just getting there with the feature. So a little hard to justify the expense at this point, but it's clearly coming. And some of the things that are there are already quite amazing. So what are the re uh, expected results of Copilot? Uh, a drastic improve in productivity. Microsoft thinks 50% every year. Uh, how to measure that, I have no idea. Uh, but the reality is it, it does make you quite a bit more productive. Um, and again, we're at the very beginning of this. So you know, cut it a little bit of slack as to what's out there right now. There's, there's truly amazing things coming. And here's a case study that was just announced by Klarna as to how they use uh, the same technology in their applications for a customer service facing things uh, thing. And in a month, they had something like 2.3 million conversations in the customer service department where the AI chatted uh, with customers, replacing 700 full-time agents or supplementing at a scale of 700 full-time agents. And in terms of customer satisfaction, it was on par with human agents. Uh, it created 25, uh, well, it created more accurate responses, uh, meaning they had a drop of 25% in repeat inquiries where customers had to come back and ask questions again. Uh, it also reduced uh, the average problem solving time from 11 minutes to two minutes. Uh, and they figured this added $40 million to their bottom line. So. This is not some vague, uh, maybe it's useful or not. This is very concretely useful. And if you're not doing it at this point, your, your competitors probably are. Okay. Um, 
very, very quick excursion into what large language models actually are and what they do. Uh, there's always interest in how does this actually work, right? I, it doesn't truly matter to, to most people, but everybody's still interested in how this works. And I have a few slides in here that kind of explain how this works based on uh, some examples with Bob Dylan's poetry. Uh, basically, it just does a statistic analysis of massive amounts of text. And so it says, if I find the word you in a piece of text and I need to answer uh, to what comes after you, which is all these models really do, it's just they predict the likely answer, the likely next word. Then in this case, it could analyze this text and it could say, well, after the word you, these uh, five phrases are equally as, as likely, so that's what I should say. And if we repeat this exercise with all kinds of patterns and on a very large scale, we can eventually build something that can, uh, on, a, on a very small scale, generate Bob Dylan-like poetry. And if we then took that further, we'd eventually arrive at something like uh, GPT. So this is from a session that our very own Dr. Otto Dobritzberger did. And again, uh, we have a recording of the session on our Code Presents website that you can watch for free. So that's uh, the main thing there that I want to point out here. Now, a lot of people go, ah, well, maybe I can then train my own LLM. That's usually the first thing new customers ask me. Well, how do I train my own large language model? And the reality is you do not train your own large language model. You use what's out there. Why? Because the scale involved is just absolutely mind boggling. Like here, here's an example of the infrastructure that Microsoft puts behind this. This is the Microsoft Dublin data center, uh, which is one of 150 new data centers Microsoft is bringing online uh, in, a, I think, an 18 month period that we are more than halfway through at this point, I think. Uh, this data center, if you look at uh, the trucks in this picture, uh, the cars, the people, you get a, a sense of scale. This data center, uh, they have about a mile long and a half a mile wide under roof there in Dublin. And that's one out of 150 such data centers they built. So unless you're up to operating at that scale, you're not building uh, your own la large language models. I mean, for something like GPT-4, we are talking about you know, eight, 10 months to, to train and, and hundreds of millions of dollars in expense just to run that operation. So you don't do that, you just use what's there. Now you could fine tune models. In other words, you could train a little more uh, to be more applicable to your specific need. Uh, that's for very specific scenarios. We hardly ever have that need. Most of the time we can make the existing AI do what, what we want it to do. So that's the expectation there. Now, one of the things I always tell people is if you have apps that don't use this stuff, your apps are now legacy, right? Don't fall behind. If you are the leader in your industry, don't miss the boat and let a competitor leapfrog you. If you are that guy that wants to leapfrog and the leader in your industry doesn't do this, this is your chance, your possibly once in a lifetime chance to do this. If you're building in-house apps, you certainly want to make your people more productive, right? It's the, there's very few scenarios where you don't want this stuff at this point. And, and so what can you build with this on your own? Because that's really what it's about as a developer. You want to build this type of stuff. And here's an example of something that we have built for, for one of our customers. That's a homeowners association who uh, has allowed us to use the screenshot. Thank you very much. Uh, and so what this is, uh, they represent hundreds of homeowners associations around the country. Uh, and then, of course, when you have a homeowners association, you always have a lot of people that live in your neighborhoods that say, hey, when is trash pickup? When is the pool open exactly? And so here's an example of a, a knowledge base, institutional knowledge that we have. And in this, we can now ask a question like, when is the pool open, which will then imply that you somehow have to be able to look up information such as when is the pool open, but you also have to understand what neighborhood does the, the user live in? Uh, what year are we in? What documents do we have that are current? What documents do we have that security-wise people can access? 
that's a big thing, right? The security part that most people always forget. Business logic, most people forget. Uh, most people just say, here's 20 PDF files, answer some questions. Well, that's it's a cute proof of concept, but in a real world, you need to take this uh, much further. So this is an example where it, op where it answers that question truthfully and factfully, and it doesn't hallucinate and, and come up with nonsense, but it answers that question. Uh, it provides uh, source documents that you can then go and look into. It provides meaningful follow-up questions for this particular question, like, hey, can I rent the pool maybe for my private party, right? Stuff like that. And of course, that cuts down on a lot of expenses when you can do that sort of stuff. And one of the things that I love in this particular example, uh, of course, people that live in these neighborhoods speak different languages. In the past, that meant you had to have knowledge bases. And you know, if you had 40 different languages that you needed to support, you had a knowledge base in 40 different languages. With this stuff, you can actually go ahead and you can ask that question in a different language. So in this example, the same question was asked in German. Now note that it's still searching for the information uh, with the search term of pool hours in the original English language in this particular case brings up the English language knowledge base to give to the AI. And then it says, hey, AI, here's the information in English. But go ahead and answer the question in the original language that the question was asked. And hence, we are getting a, an answer in German here based on an English knowledge base and based on English institutional knowledge. And, and you know we have the links into the source documents. But then we have the suggested follow-up questions. And they are still. Uh, in the original language that the question was asked. So, so that in itself to me is just a mind-boggling example. I'm talking to people in the tourism industry and all kinds of other stuff where this just cuts out millions and millions of dollars of expense that are really rather unproductive. And this was done using Azure OpenAI from a developer's point of view. So we are simply interacting with, uh, with uh, a GPT 3.5 model in this case. And we are also using some other features, like we're taking all the institutional knowledge that we have and we stick that into Azure Cognitive Search. So when the AI needs to figure out additional data, the first thing we do is, is we say, hey, AI, uh, this question was asked. What data do you need to answer that question? And then it'll say, well, I need to know the pool hours. And then we go and we find the pool hours in our database, uh, in this case, Azure Cognitive Search, but it could be something like an Amazon Elasticsearch or something like that. Uh, and then we get that information, give it to the AI, and the AI answers that question. Um, so very, very powerful. All happens through Azure OpenAI. We could have also used OpenAI directly. There's two different ways of using this. Uh, but we like to use Azure OpenAI in this case because this customer already happened to be an Azure customer. They uh, use uh, that compute, you, you pay per use when you use AI. So you know, it's not very expensive to them in this case, a few bucks a month. Uh, but it comes through on their regular Azure bill, and that's very nice. And the data is safely in the Microsoft ecosystem. They trust that. Uh, so that's why we chose that way. But we could have also chosen uh, going directly with OpenAI or other models for that matter. And that's something we do quite a bit too, is where we combine these things. Now, let me show you some other stuff here. Um, and let me bring up another instance of Visual Studio. And I'll show you a, a slightly bigger version of something like this, which is uh, a knowledge based technology we have. So let me open this project here. And what this does is it's, it's technology we make available to our customers. Uh, it's a knowledge base consolidation product. I'm going to show you a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, so when I run this, it's going to launch our institutional knowledge or a development version thereof and a system that allows us to query that. Uh, it's an, a .NET application that interacts with, uh, again, Azure OpenAI, but uh, you know, using some Azure, other Azure features as well. So. Whereas my browser should start up any moment now. Okay, here it comes. So I'm just running on local host, but I'm integrating with, with all kinds of different sources of institutional knowledge. So it could be like in this case, it's a employee manual type of thing, but it's also 
you know, I could drill into this and figure out how our infrastructure works, what standard processes are. I, I could go in here and say, who are the most recent signups for the stato.net event today? And all that sort of stuff is in this knowledge base. But so now I could go in here and I could say, oh, let me ask a question to our copilot that we built, right? This is not Microsoft copilot, but this is a copilot we built. So I could say, I am being bullied at work. What should I do? Now we have several documents that have information about that. So this is now looking through a knowledge base of infinite size. Uh, that's what's different from what a lot of other people do. Uh, where they're like, oh, here's my three documents, my PDF files that are our employee or, or uh, uh, HR manuals, right? So in this case, unlimited size documentation. And we search through this documentation, come up with some information. And then here's the answer to that particular question pulled together potentially from a number of different documents. In this case, it's just one and I could drill into it and, and find more information about that. That's what it used to answer this question. And then it says, here's some interesting uh, follow-up questions, right? What, uh, what would be a good strategy for conflict resolution at work might be a good follow-up question. And it's then gonna answer that question for us, right? So here is that. And again, this works in, in any language. I have no idea how many languages, any language that's on the internet. So, um, you know, I could ask this in German again. Uh, do that. And, uh, you know, it's still using the English institutional knowledge that we have. Uh, but it's going to answer this particular question in German. So how does all of this work? It's actually more straightforward than you would think. Uh, we have uh, an ASP.NET MVC uh, type of app here. So we have a controller and that controller has a method that can answer copilot questions. And then we have our own little framework that we use to interact with, in this case, OpenAI, but we make it pluggable so we can go to different backend processing mechanisms because this uh, industry is very much in flux. So if tomorrow somebody comes out with a model that's faster, that's better, that's cheaper, I might just, just switch over to that. Or, or maybe we discover that certain types of things, a different model can answer better, right? But in this case, you say, okay, well, you had a question. Uh, for that question, we probably need some extra data. So we use an AI and we say, hey, uh, first of all, we need to find documents related to this. Give me a search term for this question, right? So when I say I, I'm, I'm, I'm being bullied at work, then a good search term might be workplace bullying, right? Uh, so we say, you know, regardless of the original language, answer in English, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and here are some examples of what people might ask. And this is called few shot prompt engineering. This helps the AI uh, come up with better results. Now, you see these four different examples, but that doesn't mean that it can only do these four different examples. It just gives it a little bit of a better idea of what I'm after, and then it can do pretty much anything. Uh, and then I say, okay, these are some examples, but here's the real question. Go ahead and answer it. That gives us a search term, which then allows me to go into Azure Cognitive Search, which is uh, an, a service that Microsoft offers. It's an AI powered search engine, if we want to think of it like that. So we mirror all our data into that, and then we can ask this question and back come documents, and they are ranked by significance. It's like a Google search, right? That gives us back documents uh, out of our own system. And then we take those documents and we create a larger prompt. We now say, hey, you're an assistant, go ahead and answer this question. You're always using this format for the question answering. We want an answer, we want the document references that you used, we want follow-up questions. Um, and, and then we also go through and we say, here are the documents we have. Do a loop over the documents we have and inject the appropriate information into the search term and then go ahead and answer the question but in the original output language. And as a result, well, we then get something like this. Right? So the big difference between what this is and what a lot of people do is we control our own destiny in terms of where the knowledge comes from. It's called retrieval augmented generation and we do this ourselves. A lot of people use other things like Langchain would be a popular framework. Semantic kernel works pretty well. We use that quite a bit. Uh, and so that's perfectly viable ways to go as well. 
uh, that we would recommend based on the scenario. But it's in, um, important to realize that when you let a tool do that, like Microsoft has this feature called bring your own data where you can just let it have at your own data and then answer questions. It just does the same thing behind the scenes. And, and the question is, does it do it good enough out of the box, which is fine then? Or do you want to fine tune that and have control over it, which I often am a big fan of? Uh, so that's, that's one example of what we're doing is this kind of a, a search. Now, I want to show you one more thing here out of our own infrastructure. And this is an application that we use internally to manage our own business. So the code group does a number of different things. We do a lot of events like the seminar you're in right now. We do training, we do consulting, we do custom app dev, we publish a magazine, we have a staffing division. And so this app that you see here is one of the many apps that we have to manage our own business. So for instance, I could look up all the people associated with the code group, whether that is employees or customers or whatever else, right? And so this is my own record and I could now uh, drill into this record here and, and find information like, you know, I had subscriptions to the magazine and I wrote articles and all kinds of stuff is in here about myself, right? So it's a system that we use uh, to manage our own data. And we've built co-pilots into that. So I can bring up our code copilot here. Again, this is not something Microsoft built. This is something we made from scratch using OpenAI and using these copilot ideas. Now I can do a standard query like you've just seen here, but I can also ask, use copilot to ask questions. So I can say, for instance, do we have anyone in our database from EOG resources? which is a customer of ours and a partner organization that you know, allows us to show limited amounts of data. I'll, I'll show you in a moment what I'm doing. Uh, who is a magazine subscriber and or also attended any of our events? Please provide a list, replace their names with fake names for privacy reasons, okay? Because I don't want to show that data off here for real. But so now I go and I do that, and uh, now Copilot needs to first understand what I'm uh, trying, uh, whoops, <laughs> development version here. I have some kind of bug, but anyway, I'm showing you how the sausage is made. Ignore the man behind the curtain, I guess. Uh, so it has to figure out what I'm trying to do then understands it has to go search this information in our knowledge base. Oops, wrong one. Has to search this information in our knowledge base. Again, we take the data we have in SQL Server and in other data stores and mirror that into Azure Cognitive Search in our case, which is one of many choices that you have to do so. Um, and that allows us to then query this data store in an AI type of way. And it can then bring that back and answer questions. And uh, unfortunately, I had some sort of data inconsistency here uh, in my development version, but you know how that goes. And, and so it would have just listed the people and provided us some interesting information. And then we can ask more questions about it. Another example is we can go into our article database. Uh, so, for instance, I can look up all the articles that our editor-in-chief has written and I could then go into any of this and, and you know, find uh, a you know, 2008 editorial that he wrote. And this is our magazine management system. So, we have our articles in here, our authors, and we have the actual content of the, of the article, right? So, I could see here a preview. I could go online and and see the digital version of that article on our website. This is the system we use to manage this. And there's some interesting stuff in here, like an abstract as to what this is about. So if you do a search for articles, this is in the list, you'll then see this, this short synopsis of what this article is. And it says here, this is the January, February 2008 editorial by Rob Paddock. It's like, well, that doesn't tell me a whole lot. Uh, why is this so non-informative? It's because it's hard to come up with these when you have so many articles. But check this out, I have this button up here called generate an article abstract. And when I click this button, my AI reads through the article and then creates a more meaningful 
abstract for this particular article. So that's that's pretty cool, right? Very, very useful. Uh, another thing I can do is I can bring up a true copilot pane here. And in here, I can now start asking questions, right? So I could say, for instance, do we have any articles in our database that are similar to this one? Please list them. Now, when you think about a query like that, right, trying to find similar articles in our database, uh, and I don't even know what this is about, Agile Software Development, apparently, like how would you implement this? You have to comprehend what this text is about, you then have to find similar content, and then you have to answer the original question in a meaningful way. And so it says, yes, there are art other articles in our database, and here is a list of them. And I could now click on any of these, and it's fully integrated into our own app, and therefore it can bring up the other article and let me see what this article is all about. So that's kind of cool, right? So we are using OpenAI features and Copilot features to go in and make sense of things that we couldn't do before. I, I find this tremendously uh, useful and productive and economically viable for my organization or important for my organization, I should say. All right, so that's a specific way of, of using a lot of this stuff, which is we want questions answered, which to me is, is the far more a uh, valuable part of AI than to generate an article for me, right? I, I, I'm working with my data, help me with that. So, and, and then once we have the AI doing that and realizing it needs more data, we get that data and we then inject that data and it answers the question. A slightly different way of looking at it would be to say, I just want a better way to query, right? It's nice to be able to go in here and query by name and other features that I have. And that goes and does a SQL Server query because that's the database we use for our rectangular data in this case. Uh, so it's cool to do that. But what if I want to do a much more complex query? For instance, uh, one of my people just told me the other day, he says, I want customers who had a subscription or an invoice or an, a, attended an event more than 20 years ago and who are still active with us today. In other words, we want to find customers that have been with us for a long time that are still active customers and we want to do something nice for them. Now, if you think about something like that, that somebody communicated to me in whatever email or spoken word or whatever, how would you create a query for that? How would you create an interface that would be flexible enough to do that? So for the first time, I'm now going to show you something that nobody has seen before. And that's an experimental feature so we see how well it works. It's a definitely a work in progress. But we made this intelligent query in here. And in this query, I'm just going to paste this text just like this person wanted me to give him data for. And I'm going to say, OK, do this. Now, the interface for this is horrible. Uh, and like I said, we're still fine tuning a lot of this stuff to make this work. Um, but in a moment here, it hopefully will actually produce a meaningful result for us. Now, this is going to be a pretty complex query. We should have some kind of progress indicator or something going on. Uh, so bear with me here. UI design wise, this is not yet one of my prouder moments. And here is our data now, right? These are all the people that match that particular criteria. How is this different from other Copilot stuff? It's different in that we didn't ask Copilot to answer a particular question that uh, included a handful of documents, but we asked Copilot to do a truly amazingly sophisticated query over a database that probably has well over 100 tables that are related and joined and normalized and not that easy to deal with. And it then came up with this list of people that have been with us for a long time. And so I could drill into one of those and, and I could now see, did he indeed have a subscription uh, a long time ago? And here's one from 2003. So yes, absolutely, this is possible. Uh, and then uh, events, yes, he attended an event relatively recently, uh, right? So it totally matched the query that we wanted to do. So that's pretty amazing, right? And then it didn't return just text, but it returned to us rectangular data from a query. And that's really the big thing, right? So there's Two or three things that we are showing off here for the first time that nobody's seen before, and that is we're using LLM type of interaction 
going against rectangular data without the need of a vector search index. Um, and then returning it as rectangular data that then ties into an existing older app and provides data in the structure the app needs. And then from that point on, the app continues on its way, which is tremendously compelling because it means you can retrofit your old apps with this amazing new feature set and do things that nobody would have thought possible before. So how does this work? Well, we are still using OpenAI. We are still using uh, the same type of features that Copilot does, but we are actually generating in simple terms, we're generating queries. Now, some of you may have said, hey, Marcus, but you told us never generate a query uh, on the fly like that. It's not secure. It opens up security holes like crazy. It's a SQL injection fest, all that sort of stuff. Well, what we are showing here for the first time today is actually a system where we managed to make that safe for a variety of reasons. And without going into all the details and the secret sauce, for those of you who are interested in that, I invite you to connect with me separately. It's a longer discussion uh, that's not totally trivial, but as you can see, it, it's totally doable. And, and the resulting feature set, I couldn't be more excited about. I think this is tremendously cool. We don't need a, uh, a separate search index. It also allows us to do questions that a search index in a vector database is not good at. Right? It's easy to say, hey, show me somebody who went to an event and had a magazine subscription because that's in the data. But what's difficult with the vector database to do is to say, give me data that is older than X, right? Because how did that data is not, you know, there's a date field that says it's from 2005, but I want older stuff. So it's a typical where clause. It's not a text search operation. Uh, so having this feature set now baked in, the, the I'm, I'm tickled pink about this. I think this is tremendously superbly useful um, and, and we're probably going to talk about that quite a bit and again doing it securely if you do this on your own be very 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 careful because you're very likely to open up security holes like crazy and your admins are probably not going to allow you to do that so important to do it right um, so that's kind of cool um, moving along here though uh, slightly different topic here ml.net we're talking about AI in general. We're not just talking about large language models. We're not just talking about uh, image generation. We are talking about AI in general. And if you want to uh, train your own AI to do certain things, there's many products out there that allow you to do that. If you're in the .NET world, and this is a state of .NET presentation after all, a, a really good tool to do that is ML.NET. It's a, a package you can add to your app. And when you do that, you can uh, train your own models, those are shallow learning models that are smaller, and they're usually mathematical things. So things like uh, predicting uh, product demand over the holidays, or predicting customer sentiment, or predicting whether something is spam or not, right? All those types of things uh, you can do very well with ML.NET. And I have this example uh, where I use ML.NET to, to do a pretty much every machine learning person learns at first, which is the ability to uh, take the customer manifest of the Titanic and predict based on where they were, what class they traveled, wh how old they were, uh, and all kinds of other factors, how likely they were to survive that, right? So that's kind of uh, a very typical example that a lot of people do. And you can do that with ML.NET very easily by pointing it at that data and training it, and then you can predict what you're doing. Now, one of the problems with a lot of these uh, machine learning things is data scientists or developer do this stuff and then they have a prototype and they can show it working. And then that's usually where it falls apart. It never goes into production. How do I actually deploy this in production? And what I really like is combining it with LLMs. So I have a simple example. I'm just going to go through this very, very quickly just to show you how it's running. And this is actually, we had a training class here yesterday for OpenAI, and I did this example there. So let me just show you what this does. So in this case, I'm just, I have a CSV file with the real customer information from the Titanic. And using this customer information, I'm training up a model using ML.NET, which is relatively simple. You basically tell it what fields you want to include in the training and, and, and then you have a flag in there, a column that says, did they survive or not? That's what you're training for. 
And then there's a method call here that says go do it. This runs two, three seconds, trains the model. And then once we have the model, we can use it and we can say, hey, create me a predictor. This is basically launch the AI. And here's some information. I have a customer this old, uh, male in third class. Are they likely to survive this, right? So let's just go ahead and run this. Where did it go? Is it already running? It's still starting up. Let's try this again. Still loading. Because everything slows down when you do screen sharing like that. Actually, somewhere. No. I think my window is off screen somehow. And see it went somewhere just don't know where the win where the window went well maybe we'll have to skip this sample here uh, we also have a recorded version of that and i'll i'll point you at that as well uh, but you know the point is it would train the sample within a matter of just a few minutes see here it is i don't know where i could move it well, windows is not showing me that window it's not good Close that. I'm going to try it one more time. There it is. Yay. <laughs> so here we have our training pass. It goes through all the data that we have for Titanic customers. It says it's trained. It took two seconds to train. And now we can do some predictions there. Right? So I can now say, okay, if I was 35 years old, traveled in second class and was a male, what is my chance of survival? And it says, so not very good, right? But if I was 25, traveled in first class and I was a female, I probably have a much better chance of survival. Now, these are pretty obvious examples, but you could go into more detail and it would actually do a pretty good job at that. Uh, but what was really cool now is, uh, let's exit out of that. And I go into this additional mode of using a large language model. So now it says, hello, I'm an AI-powered chatbot. I gave it the personality of David Attenborough uh, and say, please ask me anything. And I can say, what do you know about the Titanic? And it'll give me uh, some sort of, you know, documentary style information about it. But then the more interesting thing is I can say, uh, since I just turned... 35 years old, and I am a successful businessman from London. I think I should treat myself to a trip to New York on the Titanic. What do you think of that idea? So now when we do that, it's not just so much a matter of the large language model answering based on its own information, but I wanted to use my predictor and say, oh, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, how likely are you able to survive, right? Would, would I be likely to survive the trip? Right, And now in purple here, I'm, I'm echoing out some debug information. I've configured my language model to say, okay, well, don't answer that directly. If it's about survivability of the trip, I have a function for you to call. And that function calls into the custom trained smaller model. And then with this, you can pass information to that and get predictions back. And it says the passenger will likely die. And note that it remembered I said I was 35. 
I said I was a businessman, so it knew I was male. And it didn't know what class I was traveling on, but because I said I was a successful businessman, likely I was going to travel in first class. And all of this added up to not being very likely to survive. So it's like, well, that's a bummer. Um, that's a bummer. Would my wife be likely to survive the trip? Okay, and then it makes some other assumptions. It's female still in class one. And oh, she would be likely to survive, right? Now this purple stuff is just debugging for people wouldn't see that. But then based on this information I just retrieved, uh, retrieved the, the LLM can then start giving a meaningful answer that's much more fact-based than anything else I could do. So sh long story short, right? I have better recordings of this, this demo. Um, but I'm a real fan of combining different AIs like that because now this is how you put this stuff in production. And I, I think that is like super cool. So that's ML.net in combination with LLMs. Now I know I'm way over time again. Uh, surprise, surprise. I usually do this, right? But I want to briefly talk to you about art generation. Dolly 2, Dolly 3, uh, Mid Journey, there's different things that you can use. I talked about Stable Diffusion 3 that's been announced, even though it's not quite out yet. But those things you can also now invoke as an SDK. So you can write code that simply pings uh, an AI in the cloud. You can pass it some text, and then it generates art for you. Now, to show you how we are using this, let's go back into our in house application here. And let's go back to some of those articles we just had. So I still have this article edit form open here that we used a moment ago. I had about Rod Paddock's article. And uh, another thing that I have in here is this generate art button. Because what we would like with articles is if somebody shares them on Facebook or Instagram or something like that, we'd like a piece of art, some graphic show up. Right now, in this case, this is about an agile world. I have no idea what we do for that. Usually, we have the problem that in the computer world, it's very abstract, right? It's like another performance tuning article. What does performance tuning look like? Uh, another rocket ship sort of stuff, right? It's, it's difficult to come up with, with interesting imagery. If we were a travel magazine, I'm sure it would be easier, right? Like we could just say a cool view of. Paris and the Eiffel Tower, right? If we were writing about a trip to Paris. Now, what we can do in here is through this interface, we can say, based on this idea, suggest us an image. And when we do that, we communicate with Dolly 3, in this case, running in the Microsoft Cloud. And it will go and it will generate us an image based on this prompt that I just sent it here. Now, this takes a few seconds, but not very uh, long. And this is original art created just for us. And here is the image, right? I can now double click into that and I can say, wow, that's actually a pretty darn cool image of Paris, right? In fact, this is so cool, I'm going to save this away. Um, and interestingly enough, from my original prompt, it actually takes a take on that and say, well, what, I'm, what you really mean is a breathtaking scene, scene showcasing the grandeur of Paris, the iconic Eiffel Tower stands tall, blah, blah, blah. And it does that, right? So now I could maybe use that and I could say, it's all good. Uh, make it the year 2300 and then suggest an image for that, right? And so I could kind of work my, my way through this, which is kind of cool. Um, but then again, we're not a travel magazine, right? So so that's not totally applicable to us. What we really need to do is we need to have a good way to generate these ideas. So we have a multi-step process here. We can actually say, suggest us a prompt based on the article. In other words, AI, go through the article, read it, and then come up with an idea. So when I click this button here, it reads through the article and then says, oh, well, here's an idea. How about this? An image that represents a futuristic city skyline at night with neon lights and flying cars. Uh, use Blade Runner and the Matrix as, as uh, inspiration, right? The focus should be on, on whatever, right? Something that relates to the article. And I may like that or not. I may say, no, this was not good. Suggest something else. Or I could go in and tweak it a little bit. Um, 
So uh, this says, now how about a chessboard and puzzle pieces? And I was like, okay, well, go ahead, uh, create me an image or maybe two images based on that. And by the way, here is our Eiffel Tower in the year 2300. So flying stuff and, you know, slightly modified version of the a more modern version of Paris. Still pretty cool. I'm going to save that also. Right, so that's pretty nice. Uh, but here is now some imagery that it generated based on the ideas that it had for this agility article. And that may be much more applicable. I didn't read the article, right? But this may be much more applicable. So it's kind of cool. So we've now had an AI read the article, then come up with original ideas, be creative, then use another AI to create two different versions of these images. And now all I need to do is I need to take that and I need to create uh, like 10 different versions of this one for Instagram, one for our website. And I have another AI piece that I can launch here uh, that generates out of this real art, right? So it says, well, you'll need the following things, right? Like, uh, like, uh, like this is what goes on Instagram, right? It needs to look like that. So it takes that piece of art and then applies more logic to it and says, oh, well, it needs a logo. It needs a title. Where should this go so it looks good? And we could now say, fine, this all looks great. Or we could fiddle with it a little bit, save as an attachment, and it goes into our database and on our website. And, and we would have now published 10 pieces of art right there. Right? And so that's what it takes for us now to go from having zero idea to having a really cool uh, visual image associated with our article. Okay? So, so cool stuff there. And I have in my slide deck, I have some examples of what some of the images are that it created for us, right? Like this was related to, it came up with this idea for an, for an ASP.NET article, like an ASP, right? Snake, uh, Cobra snake, not totally the same, but still pretty cool. Uh, it likes to do a lot of these futuristic cities, uh, prawn inspired, but pretty darn good art if you look at that. Uh, then completely different style, uh, castle in the Alps with uh, old style farmhouses around it. Like, wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, oh, how about a more modern version of a castle that's, uh, that's in the future and semi-digital and flying objects around it, right? I was like, wow, that's detailed. Um, another cityscape with the races, I think a performance tuning article. Uh, this was for an, a Polar's article that's about visualization of statistics. So used the polar bear and it used the uh, stats. Pretty cool image. Uh, this is, uh, I don't remember what, uh, what the prompt was for this, but I just found it to be, like how does it come up with this, right? Dogs riding a bicycle with huge eyes. And they, the, the guy even has a dog of his own in a little basket that cracks me up when I look at this. Uh, this was about spam filtering. It came up with this idea, right? Uh, I live in Hawaii. Hawaiians are said to use to eat a lot of spam, though I've never tried it. Uh, but so it did like, uh, like an old style Hawaiian uh, advertisement poster uh, as an anti-spam article. Here was one related to tourism and skiing. Uh, here was one related to writing XML files. It came up with this. Look at the intricacy of this particular image. The smoke, the, the uh, decorations on the thing he's sitting on. Just amazing art, right? Like if I had to pay an artist to do this, it'd simply be cost prohibitive. Uh, this one was for... Uh, uh, the impersonation of an AI, right? So really, really cool. So very, very advanced, sophisticated art that, that is now created by Dolly 3 and a lot of these other image generators. Uh, and these are, like I said, leapfrogging each other. Um, and there's a, another recording we have on this topic that goes into a lot of details on this. I'm already way over time again, of course, as I always do in these presentations. Uh, but go watch that recording if you're interested in image generation by uh, Otto Dobritsberger. It's a free recording. Uh, and again, we'll send you a link to that. So that is my overview of what's possible today in AI. Uh, I hope you got the idea that you can do things that are tremendously useful and valuable for businesses especially. Uh, so if you're an enterprise that needs to use this stuff in-house, if you're creating a product, 
right? You, you want this. If you want to extend the Microsoft Copilot ecosystem, all those things are now very, very possible and tremendously useful. And if you have any questions on this, like I said, if uh, we are more than happy to answer your questions. We're not going to send you a bill for that. Uh, so if you are interested in how does this apply to my scenario, feel free to contact us. If, if you're a developer sitting in this thinking, wow, my, develop, my, my manager should really know about this, my board of directors should really know about this, then uh, you know, take advantage of our free executive briefing offering that we have. So you know, a few announcements uh, related to this. We have training classes about this. In fact, we just did one yesterday. We got another one coming up as well. We have the executive briefings. Here are those URLs again. Uh, if you need people that help you build this stuff, we have our staffing division that can help you long term. We have our consulting division that can help you advise uh, on, on short term projects. We have our app dev division that can build these apps for you. Uh, if you are somebody who's looking for a job, uh, right? If you work for one of our customers, we're not going to hire you away from them, right? That's a no no for us. But if you're looking, for a job and develop your career further, uh, consider our current uh, openings that we have. We have many, we are hiring like crazy. Um, uh, again, a free subscription to the magazine might be useful to you. Uh, we'll sign you up for one. Feel free uh, to share this barcode or this URL with your friends uh, if they want a, a magazine subscription. Again, no strings attached, it's just a free subscription that we extend to event attendees. Um, we have our YouTube channel. Subscribe to the YouTube channel so you get videos like, like a recording of this video. You get other events that we do, other short videos we are doing. And again, my uh, question or my ask for you, please help me out. Fill in uh, this short survey. It's, a hand, it's, it's like one page with a few questions, very short. Take you 30 seconds. But it tremendously helps us in terms of planning what we want to do in the future. What topics do you want to hear? Uh, what do you like? What don't you like? Right. So please do me a favor. Fill this in. It would really be helpful to me. And that takes us to the end. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stick around here a little bit longer for questions. But then again, contact me at my email or send to the info at codemac.com address if you have further questions. If you send it to me, it goes in my inbox. I will sooner or later respond. I'm always behind on my email. Maybe Copilot will help me catch up a little more. Uh, but certainly if you send to info.copemac.com, my guys and gals will be much, much faster in responding to you and making sure uh, it also gets brought to my attention. So don't hesitate to consider us a resource. Uh, we're more than happy to help out. So thank you very much. Uh, Tim, is there any questions online? Nothing at this point. Uh, then we'll wrap it up. Uh, hope you found this useful. Uh, sorry for going over, but uh, people that come to my events know that I usually do when I have the freedom to do so. And uh, this stuff, this stuff is fun. I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I do. Thank you.